the iPhone is surely one of the most incredible feats of marketing that the world has ever seen. I should say, you know, I've, I've had iPhones before. I have nothing against them. They're a good product. But isn't it absolutely amazing that a new iPhone comes out normally in September and suddenly you have to have it. The display is so much sharper than the one before. The camera is so much better. The processor is so much faster than what you have in your pocket. You have to have it. And then, somehow, 12 months later, somehow Apple managed to convince you that this new phone that you got a year ago and you had to have it and it's the most brilliant phone that's ever come out, it's now completely and hopelessly out of date. So you have to buy another. It's, it's brilliant marketing. And the reason why that marketing works is that Apple and many other companies, of course, they're able to tap into something that's true of our society. We live, surely, in a society where there is very little contentment. And if all that means is that, you know, you buy a new phone more often than you should, that's maybe not a massive deal, it's maybe not a huge problem, but sometimes a lack of contentment can be far more serious. A lack of contentment can leave us absolutely crippled. Being discontent can leave us angry. It can leave us agitated. It can leave us all worked up over how our lives have turned out. Uh, we can end up absolutely consumed with, with regrets and with disappointments and with bitterness. That, that bitterness, it can sort of bubble and fester under the surface, can't it? It can be incredibly toxic. And the way to avoid that bitterness is contentment. And here we have a psalm that speaks to us all about that. A psalm about being content. As we start to look at the psalm, I want you to imagine a newborn baby boy or a baby girl. Some of you have been there, of course. They're so, so tiny, aren't they? And maybe you remember what it was like the first time you took that baby out of the house. Maybe you went to the supermarket, for example, and you had the baby in the pram, and all these people stopped, and they all had a good gawk, and they all said, Ah, oh, isn't he so, so cute? But very quickly... I'd imagine there came a point where if you're the mum or the dad, or maybe you're just the big brother or the big sister, the last word that you would ever use to describe that baby is cute. Because you look at them, and they're so, so tiny, and yet you're absolutely amazed at how much noise they're able to make. It's absolutely ear piercing your head is thumping and it just seems to bounce off the walls and the longer it goes on the louder it seems to get and the problem is of course there's only one way to make that crying stop and if that baby is a breastfed baby there's only one person who can make the noise stop and until that baby gets his mother's milk, he is absolutely frantic. Of course, one of the reasons why breastfeeding is such a difficult thing for mothers is that babies don't stay full for very long, do they? And very, very quickly, you, you fed your baby boy, you fed your baby girl, maybe they go down for a short sleep, but very, very quickly, they're screaming and they're howling and they're ravenous all over again. Young babies, 
are about as discontent as it's possible to be. And I think that makes young babies a very good picture of what you and I can so easily become. What are we like when God doesn't give us the things that we want? Or maybe more to the point, what are we like when God doesn't give us the things we think we need? Well, we can so easily become restless, fretful, and full of doubts. We doubt God's goodness to us, don't we? We doubt God's wisdom. And unless something happens to deal with those doubts, they can end up festering, can't they? And we can end up crippled. By the way, there's a lot of books out there on contentment. I haven't really read any of them, but I imagine that one of the dangers you get when you read some of those books is that maybe they tend to focus on things that are perhaps a little bit trivial. Things that really don't actually matter in the grand scheme of things. And, but sometimes the things that make us discontent are anything but trivial. And serious illness can make us discontent. Family problems can make us discontent. Unemployment can make us discontent. Even bereavement can make us discontent. And there's nothing trivial about any of those things. And yet, when we think about this psalm, and whenever we think, maybe especially, about who wrote this psalm, we realise that even in these really difficult circumstances of life, there's a better way than discontentment. Notice the heading at the top of the psalm. It's David who wrote this psalm. Uh, David, as we've seen already this morning, he was a man who had life really, really tough. God had given him this really magnificent promise. He would promised that he was going to be the king of Israel. And yet, David wasn't king, was he? Or at least he wasn't king at first. He was hunted, he was harried, he was hassled by King Saul. David had to run for his life. He had to scramble out of the city. He had to go into the desert and he had to keep on going from hiding place to hiding place. Because if he didn't do that, if Saul caught up with him, well, he was a dead man walking, wasn't he? And you think about David and you think about what would have been going on in his head, in his heart, as he scrambled about in the desert. And surely... It would have been very, very easy for David to get all worked up. I mean, I would have got worked up. I, I don't know. I don't know whether you would have got worked up or whether you admit you would have got worked up. I think most of us would have got very worked up indeed. Why is God not keeping His promise? Why is God allowing all of this to happen? I've been so faithful to Him, and I'm having to run for my life. Can I actually trust a single thing that God says? And yet, as David describes himself in this psalm, we see a man of contentment. Now, I, I realise that's been a bit of a long run into the psalm, um, but I want us to see two things now, all about David's contentment, but also about the contentment that we can have as followers of Jesus Christ. And the first thing I want us to see is the joy of contentment. The joy of contentment. I want you to imagine another child this time. Not a baby, but a toddler. I can tell you from experience, toddlers do still get hungry, but they are quite different, aren't they, from those tiny little ravenous babies that have to keep on coming back for more. A toddler is able to eat proper food, adult food. That means he's able to stay full for a lot longer. And a toddler has more understanding, or 
at least sometimes a toddler has more understanding. He knows, for example, if the dinner is in the oven, it might take half an hour, but he is going to be fed. Now, toddlers, of course, they have their moments, but they don't fret and they don't wriggle and they don't worry quite like tiny newborn babies, do they? And that surely is what David is getting at here in verse 2. But I have stilled and quietened my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. David doesn't want us to imagine a baby being held by his mother. He doesn't want us to imagine a baby who's wriggling around looking for his next feed. No, he wants us to imagine a child sitting on his mummy's knee. Maybe he's got his thumb in his mouth. He's got a nice full tummy. He doesn't need anything more. And he's cuddling in just because it's mum. It's one of the the most heartwarming things that you can see, isn't it? And really, it comes at a very special moment in a person's life. That child is old enough to understand a wee bit more, old enough to be content, and yet young enough that he's still at least somewhat sheltered from some of the really horrible things that go on in the world. It's a really lovely point of life. And David is saying here, if you're a Christian, that can be your experience as well. You can have the same contentment as a weaned child. You don't have to wriggle about and fret and worry like almost everybody else around you. This peace allows you to recognize your own limitations. We see that, for example, in verse 1. And yet, even though you recognize your own limitations, you can have this confidence in your heavenly Father. This peace surely allows you, even when there's a pandemic going on, even whenever you're going through a really tough time in your own personal life, it allows you to say, a bit like David in verse 1, you know what? I don't have all the answers but I can trust God and I can accept that he has his reasons. And surely that peace, that contentment, it's something that all of us want to have. We want to be like David. We saw something of his contentment when we read from 1 Samuel. He's on the run. Saul is desperately trying to murder him. He has this perfect opportunity to thrust this spear into Saul's chest and make it all stop and you know every time I read that passage I think to myself David what are you playing at why don't you just do it why don't you put him out of his misery why don't you put things right and yet David says no and surely That was a practical outworking of what David says in this psalm. He doesn't have all the answers. He doesn't really know why God has made it so he has to run for his life. He doesn't know why God has said he's going to be king and yet years have passed and he's not king yet. But David is willing to wait. He's willing to wait for God's time. He's willing to leave this matter in God's hands. David is willing to live in the circumstances that God has called him to. David is willing to trust that whatever God's reasons are, they must be good. And of course, we don't just see that in David. I'm sure that many of us have seen that with our own eyes, haven't we? I'm sure many of us can think of faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Maybe they've been coming to the end of their days and their final days perhaps are very, very painful. Or maybe you know believers who have been through a sudden excruciating bereavement. 
and yet as you've looked at them there's been a peace a calmness a trust in god and that peace and that trust it has shone like a diamond against the dark backdrop of what they've had to face there has been a serenity amidst the turmoil of their circumstances they have been like a toddler just lying back on his mummy's lap just enjoying being with her there's been a joy hasn't there a joy even amidst the crisis and surely that is a joy that you want to have that i want to have when it's our turn to face the trial the joy of contentment second thing we see the journey to contentment the journey to contentment if you're a mum who has ever breastfed a child you'll be well aware that weaning is not something that happens overnight it's a it's a gradual process isn't it you don't just click your fingers and have it done it's a gradual process and it's a difficult process weaning as well is certainly not something that any baby has ever asked his mum to do it's very much the opposite isn't it it's the very last thing that a baby wants to do and yet there comes a point when a loving mum looks at her baby and says this may not be what you want but it's what you need so what does she do she sticks with it doesn't she there's tears there's tantrums there's fretting and i should point out those are all from the baby not from the mum but she keeps on going doesn't she and babies can't speak of course you don't know what's going through the poor baby's head but you do wonder if that baby could speak what would he say would he tell you how confused he is how hurt he is by what his mum is doing maybe but it's for his good and as i think about this psalm i wonder what does it feel like when god wins us not nice i would imagine not pleasant i wonder does it maybe sometimes feel like god is either ignoring us or god is abandoning us or maybe like god has somehow got things wrong because we can be very much like babies can't we babies have to feed every few hours and they come to rely on that feeding and i wonder are there some things that we can come to rely on maybe there are jobs or our friendships or our health or our family and we come to rely on them but they're not enough to fill us and because we have those things and they can be good things they can be great things we maybe look to them for contentment and we're just left hungry and of course we're used in the bible to god describing himself as a father aren't we but god is also like a loving mother isn't he and i wonder does god sometimes take those things away from us our health our jobs our friendships in order to still and quieten our souls think about this last year year and a half now think about all the disruption that the pandemic has caused in our lives uh, think about the family moments that we've had to miss think about the frustration of being stuck at home think about the medical appointments needed medical appointments that have been pushed 
way, way back, and we don't know when they're going to be. Think about the jobs that have been put in danger, or the jobs that have been lost. I wonder, for some of us, has that been part of God's weaning process? Has God been teaching us to look to him, not for what we can get out of him, but simply for him himself? God weans us in order that we can be content. And yet, even though God is the one who initiates this, even though God's the one who achieves this, we still have our part to play, don't we? Uh, We see that in verse 2. I have stilled and quietened my soul. Yes, it's God who takes us on the journey to contentment. It's God who sometimes brings pain and hardship into our lives in order to wean us. But we have a responsibility too, don't we? We have the responsibility to respond in the right way. A bit like David, who stilled and quietened his soul. It's our job to understand that these things that God weans us off aren't able to fill us. They aren't able to nourish us. It's our job to understand that it is only our relationship with God himself that is able to satisfy our deepest longings. And that's exactly what David calls us to do in verse 3. O Israel, Put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. And as we do that, we follow in David's footsteps, don't we? He put his hope in God in the desert, that God would do things in his time. But more especially, we follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus, don't we? Isn't that the wonderful thing about the Psalms of David? So often the Psalms are designed not just to give us an insight into David's life, but more especially to point us forward to the one who's going to come. We know that Jesus was sinless. But we're also told in the book of Hebrews that Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. wonder was that part of God's weaning process as Jesus lived as a man on this earth. You think about some of the things that can be good, but they can sometimes get in the way of our spiritual progress things that maybe we end up looking to for our security or for our joy and sometimes God needs to wean us off those things our homes our possessions our families and yet what do we read about Jesus do you remember those words those memorable words that he spoke Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus wasn't a rich man. He didn't have a lot of possessions. He didn't have financial security. And yet surely those, at least in some way, are the very facts and the very circumstances that God the Father used to shape the Lord Jesus into a godly, contented man. Do you remember Jesus' own words about his contentment? My bread is to do the will of him who sent me. And as long as Jesus was walking in the will of his Father, he was full and he was satisfied. 
surely every single one of us wants to follow in the footsteps of David. But far, far more, we want to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Surely every single one of us wants to have the joy of this contentment. Surely every single one of us wants to live in such a way that others will see us and others will want it too. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore.